Well, the Bible shows us Jesus Christ as a pretty amazing personality, doesn't it? With extraordinary powers in the miracles he performs. The most penetrating observations about human life and faith and true worship of God. No one else would dare to make the claims that he made about, as, about himself as the only source of eternal life. And his apostles speak after, about him after his ascension as having all power and all authority at God's right hand. In Jesus' own words, some of his significance there in John's Gospel. This is life eternal, that mankind might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So clearly to have any hope of life to come, Bible believers have got to seek out the truth about the person and the significance of Jesus Christ. We need to understand him as a member of the human race, sharing our frame, but rising above our being. Now many people think of him as part of the Godhead, as God the Son, existing in heaven from the beginning of time, for with God the Father, equal in power and authority to him, but coming down to earth to be born as a human being, um, then dying on the cross as a sign of God's love for mankind, before returning to heaven to be in the position he was in before. As the Holy Spirit is also regarded as part of this Godhead, this is presented as the triune God, or one in three, as described in the doctrine of the Trinity. And the relationship between these three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is understood in a very subtle way by those who defend the doctrine, and in a much more elementary way by the majority of those who, who somewhat vaguely accept it. And this view that Jesus is God is held in a rather emotional way, I guess, by some very sincere people. Anybody who doesn't accept this doctrine is thought of as unchristian, or in some way denying the position of Christ. And we need to make it very clear, don't we, to anyone who asks that, we, that, that what we believe that Jesus was, and is literally God's only begotten Son, in the way that the Bible describes. So first thing to say very clearly, the, air, the ideas in the doctrine of the Trinity aren't found in the Bible. Strikingly, we've known about this since the 4th century AD, and more recent uh, theologians have in fact said so. Here's the, the Anglican John Henry Newman, uh, who joined the Catholic Church in 1845. He wrote, the doctrines that is concerning Father, Son and Holy Spirit have never been learned merely from Scripture. And Dr. W.R. Matthews, for many years the dean of St. Paul's, he was more emphatic. The doctrine of the Trinity formed no part of the original message. St. So Paul knew it not, and would have been unable to understand the meaning of the terms used in the theological formula on which the Church ultimately agreed. Powerful stuff. And many people who, who believe themselves to be worshippers of Christ might feel pretty disturbed at that statement, that the great Apostle Paul knew nothing of the doctrine of the Trinity. So where did it come from? Well, it first appeared about uh, 300 to 400 years after the days of Jesus and his apostles. The theologians who wrote in the period 100 to 300 AD knew nothing of it, and they frequently uttered opinions that in fact contradict it. For the majority of them, there was no question of Jesus being co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. He was clearly regarded as a created being. And the teachings that now make up the doctrine of the Trinity were decisions of a number of general church councils. And here are the most significant of them. Here's the first general council at Nicaea in about 325 AD. And that declared that the Son was, from the beginning, as the same nature as the Father. 381, we have the second general council at Constantinople, which declared that the Holy Spirit was to be worshipped with the Father and the Son. The Third Council at Ephesus decreed that Jesus had two natures, divine and human, and also that Mary was the mother of God, not just the mother of Christ. How did they get there, you might ask? 
And finally, uh, in 451, the General Council at Chalcedon uh, decreed that the two natures in Christ constituted only one person and one will. The progressive ideas of the doctrine of the Trinity um, were over a considerable period of time. And that's clearly shown when the major creeds of the church are compared. Here's the Apostles' Creed. Certainly an early creed, can't sure of exact date, speaks of the relationship between Christ and God. God the Father Almighty, Jesus Christ, his only Son, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, after his resurrection, Christ ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. That's okay, isn't it? Yeah, that agrees with what the Bible tells us. But the later creeds show just how many human additions there were with a different view. Here's the Nicene Creed then from 325 AD. That declared that Christ was the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, very God of very God, being of one substance with the Father, the Holy Ghost or Spirit with the Father and Son together is worshipped and glorified. What about the Athanasian Creed? Around about 500 AD. That's even more emphatic. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity. There is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Spirit. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit is all one. Glory equal, the majesty co-eternal, the Father uncreate, the Son uncreate, and the Holy Spirit uncreate. All are declared to be eternal, yet they are not three eternals, but one eternal. And the creed concludes with the ominous statement, he that will be saved must think thus of the Trinity. It's a bit spooky, isn't it? Well, this, this new teaching, as you might imagine, generated much opposition from those holding the original beliefs, and there was bitter controversy for over a century between the church leaders. And these decisions of the councils, I think, were the actions of authorities determined to suppress all rebels. So this official doctrine of the Trinity was elaborated, proclaimed, and its acceptance declared to be obligatory. But what does the Bible say? Well, before Jesus appeared, the Old Testament had been revered, hadn't it, by Israel as the, the revelation of their God who delivered them from Egypt. What impression had they gained? about the nature of God. Judaism has only one basic idea about him, which is recognised dogma, and that's the unity of God. Here it is. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Very simple. That's a rejection of the ancient world, isn't it? With all the numerous gods. It removes the idea that there are two gods, or two creative sources of existence, one of good, one of evil. And it's a clear idea, a denial rather, of the idea of three gods in one. For Judaism, no compromise, fundamental concept of one God. The ultimate creative source of all life and death, the elements of nature and history, and the power behind all forces, physical and spiritual, say Pearl and Brooks. And to this day, the doctrine of the Trinity is a great obstacle for any Jew examining Christianity. And I think the world could do, actually, with reminding that the Old Testament that, that we have is the same collection of writings as that revered in Jesus' day as the Word of God. And Jesus himself described them as the Law, the Psalms, and the Prophets, that in them were prophecies of himself. In Psalm 2 we read, um, You are my son, today have I begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth, your possession. So God's anointed one then, who is to rule for him over all the nations of the earth. But he's God's son, because he's been begotten. The ruler is not God, he's the son of God. And he began to exist on the day that he was begotten. Like all sons, he's preceded by his father. And the whole of this general teaching is summed up in the first verse of the New Testament, isn't it? The book of the generation or genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, 
Now, when this son first, first appeared among men, how does he think of himself? And Jesus always speaks of himself as subordinate to the Father, as dependent on him for all his teaching and all his words. The Son of God, the Son can do uh, nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. My teaching is not mine, but his that sent me. The Father is greater than I. And when he's accused by the Jews of making himself God, he denies the charge and he says, I am the Son of God. He even declines to allow himself to be called good. He says, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. And in his great prophecy, shortly before he was crucified, Jesus speaks of his own coming back to the earth to reign. He says this, Then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. But of that day or hour knoweth no one, not even the angels in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And when he rose from the tomb, this was his message for the disciples. Go unto my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and to your Father and to my God and to your God. So there's no doubt, is there, about the view held by Jesus himself. In everything, the Father was superior. The Son was absolutely dependent on him. Ah, sometimes objected though, that the passages we've, we've quoted all refer to Jesus in the days of his flesh as a man. And they can't be applied to him in his exalted state. Well, let's, let's have a look at what scripture says. When Jesus was raised from the dead, his mortal nature was changed to immortality. He ascended to heaven to sit in a place of honour at God's right hand. He humbled himself, becoming obedient even unto death. Wherefore also God highly exalted him, gave unto him the name which is above every name. That in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the exaltation of Jesus to a place of honour in heaven was the work of the Father. It's he who is to be glorified. And all the decisive events in the life of Jesus are ascribed to God. It's God who made Jesus both Lord and Christ, and who has appointed him to be the judge of the quick and the dead. Many times the apostles refer to God and Jesus in their present relationship in heaven. This is how they do it. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that wording, as we know, is repeated in a number of the epistles. Whenever the text speaks of God and Jesus in heaven, they're always presented as two separate persons. The priority is always given to the Father. In the book of Revelation, our instances are of the risen Lord referring directly to his own relationship with God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. In the early chapters, Jesus refers on a number of occasions to God his Father whilst addressing the seven churches. He that overcometh, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. And here's Jesus' words, spoken about 60 odd years after he ascended into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. So they describe his relationship to God in its present glorified state. It's God the Father who's got supreme authority. It's he who gives the revelation to his Son. It's his throne that the Son shares. And it's he whom the Son acknowledges as my God. No suggestion of co-equality there, is there? But the most striking comment on the, the relative authority of God and his Son is found in Paul's description of the reign of Christ in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Then cometh the end when he, Christ, shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father. And when all things have been subjected unto him, that's Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subjected unto him, that's God, who did subject all things unto him, Christ, that God may be all in all. So in the climax of the Father's purpose for the nations of the earth, the Son's going to hand back supreme authority to the Father. Let's just think for a minute what, what that means. Jesus has now been in heaven for about 2,000 years. He's going to come back and reign on earth for a 1,000 years, it tells us in Revelation. 
when at the end of his reign then, when he hands back the kingdom to the Father, the Son will have been glorified in immortality for no less than 3,000 years. And yet after all that time, he's going to hand over the kingdom to God. That subordination of the glorified Son to the Father couldn't be clearer, could it? It's God who is, in the end, going to be all in all. Now, how Jesus came to exist is explained to Mary by an angel with a very remarkable message. Hail, thou that art highly favoured, the Lord is with thee. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, or Saviour. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Now let's just appreciate for a moment the shock of surprise and then exhilaration that these words would have produced in her. She knew quite well the promise made to David over, what, 900 years before? A descendant of David would be the means of reconciling Israel to God. And this was the long expected Messiah and she was actually to be his mother. But then maybe a, a bit of perplexity. Though Mar uh, Mary was betrothed to Joseph, they weren't yet married. So there could be no question of a child being born until they were. How then, Mary asks the angel, could this promise come to pass? And the angel is very explicit in his reply. The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that Holy One which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. <coughs> So to complete the picture then, Matthew's Gospel gives us the matter as it appeared to Joseph. Mary was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph would have been fully justified in withdrawing his promise to marry her. But an angel had a message for him from God. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For it is he that shall save his people from their sins. So Joseph knew that this child was to be the Messiah. And Matthew concludes, All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet Isaiah, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So the child's origin really clearly stressed here, isn't it? Mary was to be the mother, but Joseph was not to be the father. The child would be conceived because the power of the highest, the Holy Spirit, would operate on Mary to make it happen. So a virgin shall conceive. Her son shall be called the Son of God. This is a clear Bible teaching of the virgin birth of Christ. But there's a reluctance by many people to accept the fact that Jesus, Son of God, was fully a member of the human race. Some feel that the, to think of him as sharing our nature with all its weakness is to degrade him, to throw doubt on his sinlessness. And here again, we've got to turn to the evidence of the Bible. We've seen already the clear record of his origin, of his birth, Son of God, but also Son of Mary. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, puts it this way. When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So he was a male Israelite, living under the law of Moses. And Paul tells us why. That he might redeem them which were under the law, he says. The Jews lived under a law that condemned them, didn't it? Because they couldn't keep it without sinning. Jesus was born one of them, so he could fully represent them. In his work of redemption. The epistle to the Hebrews describes how Jesus had to be made perfect through sufferings so that he might be the author of salvation for those who are to be sons and daughters of God. For this reason he that sanctifieth Jesus and they that are sanctified the faithful are all of one that is they're all of the same nature. And he then refers to the sons and daughters as the children for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise partook of the same. So that's an explicit declaration, isn't it? That the nature of Jesus was exactly like us, flesh and blood. And the writer goes on to 
say why this had to be. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he may be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to succour them that are tempted. So in short, Jesus, in order to carry out his great work of sacrifice for sin, had to be of the same nature of those he came to save. In order to be a merciful high priest, he had to have experience of all their temptations. Chapter 4 of Hebrews. For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but one that has in all points tempted like as we, uh, as we are, yet without sin. But so many don't want to feel that Jesus literally felt temptation, that is, the urge to commit sin. Somehow they, they think this defiles him, it, it makes him less than sinless. That's a great mistake, isn't it? There's tremendous truth embodied in the living experience and death of Jesus. And we'll have a look at this now. Why was the Son of God born in this way? Well, the following statements make it very clear. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, Saviour, for it is he that shall save his people from their sins. Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. God commendeth his love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For if, when we were enemies, that is, of God, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That clear message from these sayings is that the work of Jesus <coughs> was to be a sacrifice so that sin could be put away. Men and women could be saved and reconciled, drawn near to God. We need that redemption, don't we? We need saving. For otherwise our situation is just as Paul told the Ephesians, theirs had been, when they didn't yet know the gospel. At that time, he says, you were without Christ, having no hope, and without God in the world. What a devastating verdict that was. Yet that was our case too, apart from the loving work of God in Christ. That's why the gospel of Christ is not a pleasant optional extra, is it? It's vitally necessary if we are to escape the fate of eternal death. So we come to the problem that needed to be solved. Mankind can't save itself from the consequences of sin, that is death. Yet God is not willing that any should perish. In fact, he desires that all men should be saved. Yet he couldn't overlook sin, for that would be to sort of abdicate his, his righteous authority in the world. So sin must be recognised, condemned and conquered in such a way that men and women of sincere thinking hearts can see the lesson can acknowledge its truth for themselves. We need a Redeemer who can achieve in himself and on our behalf what have we and our weaknesses are unable to do. So God manifested his only Son, begotten by the power of his Holy Spirit, yet fully a member of the human race. The Son experiences all our temptations, but firmly chooses to reject them and to do not his own will, but the will of his Father. And it's absolutely vital for anyone truly seeking salvation to understand that Jesus made that decision entirely of his own will. He wasn't forced into it by God or inevitably predisposed to it by some pre-existent consciousness in heaven. As the epistle to the Hebrews puts it, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So representing the human race, Christ conquered sin in flesh and blood where it had lived. He reversed that original failure that had led to the fall. Being himself sinless, he was able to be offered as a sacrifice, the atonement for human sin. So God, having upheld his righteousness in condemning sin, could now, in the abundance of his love and grace, extend forgiveness of sins and reconciliation to all those who will acknowledge his work in Christ. Now, if Jesus had been part of that Godhead, already existed in heaven, 
it's inevitable that he would have been deeply influenced by, by that knowledge during his life as Jesus of Nazareth. He would have known that his glorious resurrection and exaltation were certainties. He would not have needed, nor would he have been able, of his own will, to choose to obey God in the face of a human nature. His great conquest of sin as the representative of the human race wouldn't have been possible. The, ne the necessary atonement for sin wouldn't have been achieved. And understanding the truth and the nature and the experience of Jesus is essential then if we go to understand and have a hope through God's work of redemption in him. So what about the Holy Spirit? Well, the doctrine of God, the Holy Spirit, came into the Trinitarian theology of the 4th and 5th centuries. It was the last element to be declared as God. And its appearance in the Nicene and Athanasian creeds has, according to some scholars, the appearance of being a bit of an afterthought. The Bible's presentation of the Holy Spirit is very different. It's the power and influence by which God achieves his ends. In the beginning, the Spirit of God moved over the face of the waters. Creation happened. All living things, says the psalmist, depend on God. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. <coughs> By his spirit, he sustains them all in life. The prophets spoke their messages from God, not out of their own minds, but because they were holy men of God moved by the Holy Spirit, as Peter tells us. Jesus himself performed his great signs, spoke his words of life, because God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Nowhere do the, the descriptions of the activities of the Holy Spirit suggest that it, it's to be regarded as a person. Hmm. But don't some passages, you might say, in the New Testament suggest that Jesus pre-existed in heaven and came down from heaven, as the doctrine of the Trinity would have us believe. Well, there are a few passages commonly used by those who hold such views. The astonishing thing is, they are so few, hardly more than half a dozen of any substance. Now, in our time together, we can only look very briefly at a couple of them, but enough to suggest how they can be understood in harmony with the rest of Scripture. Here's the first. God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. One of the rare passages in the Old Testament, sometimes put forward in support of the Trinity. As we said earlier, though, the Jews never derived any Trinitarian ideas from them, but believed firmly in one God. And God in this quotation is Elohim, a plural word capable of either singular or plural sense, most commonly used of God himself, sometimes for those who act with him, with his authority. So it's used with the judges of Israel, appointed to make judgments in his name. Psalm 82, the rulers of the nation are called Elohim, but because they've judged unjustly, they shall die like men. In Psalm 8, uh, man is said to be made a little lower than the angels, Elohim. So there's no clear reference to the Trinity here. Although parts of this verse are quoted in the New Testament, it's never given a Trinitarian sense. Nor was this passage commonly used in debates about the subject in the early centuries. In the beginning was the Word. Vitally important here to understand in what sense, what sense John is using the Greek logos. Generally agreed that the explanation isn't in the ideas of Greek philosophers of the time, but in the Hebrew Old Testament. In Jewish religious thinking and writing, word and wisdom had come to be applied to God himself. Proverbs 8 is a remarkable passage about wisdom. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence. I am understanding. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or wherever the earth was. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. Add to that this declaration in Psalms, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. In the Septuagint, word is logos. In the Aramaic commentaries of the time, membra meant word and came to be used as a name for God. Since logos was in current use in the Greek philosophy of his day, 
John needed to give it the true sense of biblical revelation. So Logos here is at the first a thought conceived in the mind, then demonstrated in action. And it stands for the wisdom of God expressed in his purpose. So the word, therefore, represents the mind of God. That's why the word was God, or as the New English Bible puts it, what God was, the word was. The true significance of God is his mind and his will. So the word became flesh, John tells us, and in Jesus the Son of God was born. This wasn't the incarnate Son, but the incarnate word. And it's illogical to assume the pre-existence of God the Son first and then to interpret John's word in that sense. The Bible doesn't give any support to that doctrine. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Well, in what sense did Jesus come down from heaven? The narrative of his birth tells us that he came into existence because the Holy Spirit came upon Mary. So he alone amongst the human race could say that he came from heaven. He could point to the great difference between he and the Jews who were rejecting his claim. And the Apostle James gives us a valuable clue when he declares that there are two wisdoms, one belonging to the earth, sensual and devilish, the other from above, peace, peaceable, pure, righteous. The first is the natural thinking of the human mind, fulfilling its own desires. The second is the mind and thinking of God. Jesus explicitly says that he came not to do my own will, to follow his own natural desires, but the will of him that sent me, the wisdom from above. So he can say to the Jews, you are from beneath, I am from above. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Not that Jesus and God were the same person, but the Son perfectly reflected the mind and the wisdom of the Father. What about this one? Now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self before the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Well, how could Jesus have been honoured and loved by the Father before he actually ex existed? Well, I suggest the problem really arises from our limited view of time. To us, the passage of time is linear, isn't it? It's like a, a line, and separate events are distinct points on that line. We can't think of their place in history in, in any other way. But the mind of God isn't subject to these limitations. His mind is infinite in power. He's just as capable of being conscious of past situations or future ones as he is of the present. So we can't represent the divine experience of time as a line. And God's just as conscious of the sort of people uh, these men would be long before they were born because he could visualise them and speak prophetically of them, including his own son. God could plan what he'd eventually accomplish through him and could glorify and love him in advance. Peter puts it really nicely. Christ was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was manifest at the end times for your sake. And as Jesus said to the Jews, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Before Abraham was, I am. So Abraham, would, having received all the promises, look forward to the coming of the one in whom all families of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus knew that he was that one, having priority even over Abraham in God's purpose. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him were all things created, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Paul here is emphasising the preeminent position of Christ in God's purpose for the world. But in what sense was Jesus the image of God? Here's Paul's words to the Corinthians. Christ is the image of God. God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Christ is the image of God because he provided that light of the knowledge of the glory of God 
in his face, that is, in his character. So the glory of God here is, is not some bright light, is it, or, or some miraculous power, but the very character of God himself, in his holiness, his truth, and his mercy. Jesus reflected perfectly that character. As John says, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus was the image of God then, not, not as a physical replica, but as the reflection of his Father's Spirit in grace and truth. And he's called the firstborn of all creation. That title is applied to him twice in the New Testament, because he was the first member of the human race to rise from the dead, to immortality. Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead. Christ should be the first that should rise from the dead, the firstborn among many brethren. So Jesus has become the first of the new creation of immortal beings. Present believers in Christ are heirs with him of the same promise. And so, my dear friends, we've been considering the greatest work ever carried out on earth. The purpose of God, through his only Son, to redeem from the human race, beset by sin and destined to death, those men and women who desire to become a people for his name. And God foresaw from the beginning the need for a Redeemer, no less than his only begotten Son. That Son had to be fully a member of the human race, in order to be not their substitute, but their total representative. Putting aside, if you like, his natural desires. He chose to do the will of his Father. Thus sin was conquered in its own domain, human nature. Jesus died as the vital atonement, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. Never since believing men and women have found in him forgiveness of sins, and reconciliation with God. And that's why we aren't Trinitarians, isn't it, my dear friends? That's why we know Jesus was a member of the human race. To believe otherwise in, in our modern terms just doesn't make any sense. We're far away in time from the days of Jesus and his witness. And yet in the great mercy of God, we can still know and understand what he and his apostles had to say to those who were willing to listen. But only in the pages of Scripture. For as we said this morning, where else shall we go? Like Jesus, they have the words of eternal life.